Welcome to today's session where we're going to, where we're going to be sharing uh, the findings year to date for 2022 from our Future Food Tracker, specifically focusing in this particular session on sustainability and ESG. We've got a session later on at 3.30 where we'll be talking about plant-based uh, and cuisine trends in particular. I'm Charles Banks, co-founder of The Food People, and it's my pleasure as always. Delighted to be joined by Kelly Dowson, MD of Good Sense Research. Um, just as a little reminder, some of you might have heard us speak um, at Montgomery events before, but Future Food is a collaboration between the Food People and Good Sense Research, where what we're doing is grounding the Food People's um, food trend foresight in Good Sense Research's uh, consumer readiness insight. Now it's in its third year, we launched this collaboration um, with Montgomery Group events uh, in, uh, at HRC back in March 2020, so right at the beginning of um, the COVID pandemic. Kelly, can you tell us a little bit more about the tracker? Yeah, so hi everybody. Um, great to see you all. Thanks for taking the time to come and listen to us today. Um, so as Charles said, um, Charles will work through the future trend predictions and at Good Sense Research we have a community, an online community of consumers. So we send out a tracker um, which encompasses Charles's trend predictions in consumer-friendly language. We send that out on a monthly basis to um, our database and we get a minimum of 400 responses every month and that is a nationally representative sample. So it covers every demographic, every age profile, um, all across the, the UK. Um, so when we first set this up, it was primarily focused on the eating out market um, and over the last couple of years with everything that happened through COVID, we have made a few tweaks and changes. So there is areas which are more towards packaged goods and retail, um, but it's primarily focused around eating out. Um, and I think as Charles said, it's great that we've got three years of data behind us now because we can really start to see some trend lines emerging. Um, and what we're going to do today is we're going to cover um, the three years, but also look at some of the turbulence that's going on um, that we're seeing now, um, as I'm sure that's not a surprise to anybody. Um, so just to set the scene with regards to where, um, at Good Sense, we're seeing our general consumers' headspace. So I think in the, the three years that we've been running the tracker, it's never been so difficult to sort of put a story to the data and I think that's just because consumers are com confused. They're living through a lot of turmoil. For the first time in a long time we're seeing seismic macro issues across the globe not just nationally and that is taking its toll on consumers and there's, they're in a state of confusion around decision making and they're trying to adapt to new patterns. Throw into the mix that we've just had the school summer holidays and we've been having 40 degrees of heat every other day. I think it's left consumers in a bit of a state of flux. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll, we'll talk you through the year-on-year -year progress and manifestations, um, but we'll also pull out the, the sort of headlines for the last three months. And I'll apologize now for talking about cost of living crisis and COVID is still rearing its ugly head. So um, apologies if I do talk about that quite a lot. Um, so what we've sort of seen, and this will be no surprise to any of you, is that value for money is going to be a really big thing. Um, we speak to customers all over the UK, of, like I mentioned, of every different demographic, and we've met some really desperate people, and it's really quite harrowing, you know. And I, I often think all the media portray a picture, it panics people, but actually, when you're looking at somebody trying to feed a family of four and they've got £30 left in their pocket, it's, you, you can't hide away from that fact. And we're only at the tip of the crisis, um, so it'd be really interesting to see what, what Christmas looks for those like for those people. And I think we've got a, a job as an industry to try, and, to try and help with that. So value for money and the perception of it are definitely on people's agendas, no surprises there. People are tracking a lot more of their spending through different apps, through different bank accounts, Monzo. You know, it's easier for people to track their spending and that is happening a lot with consumers. They want evidence to make sure they're making the right decisions and they want to be able to track that. Positively though, consumers are being a lot more open-minded with regards to change. So for the first time ever, they're really open to shopping at different supermarkets. They're shopping at more dis discounted brands. Um, and generally speaking, there is an open-mindedness with regards to value and quality. 
Uh, we're seeing increased planning and sticking to the plan. So um, there's less impromptu meals out or takeaways. People are not as interested with that flippant decision around, oh, I can't be bothered to cook tonight, I'll just get a takeaway. If you've bought the food, you will stick to that plan. Um, how people are thinking about cook cooking is also another massive variable that we're thrown into the mix for the first time in a long time, really. Um, and I think Iceland have done a really good job with some of their unpacked comms recently um, around showing the lowest energy way to cook a meal. Um, and I think also people are thinking about how full will this keep me for how long? So that's another thought process. Um, and I think one of the overarching issues with regards to the sustainability piece is that, and you'll see this quite a lot today, is that consumers are currently prepared to make compromises to their principles because we're not living in an ideal world. Um, so just to summarize, what we're gonna go through is year on year, but the last three months of data have been quite choppy. Okay. Um, before we get into the detail of the tracker, it's all right, getting a bit of playback. Um, I wanted you to give you a sense of, in consideration of the things that Kelly's just talked about, uh, sustainability and ESG is, is here to stay. And I wanted to give you a sense of some of the longer term shifts that are existing within food and drink, but also outside of food and drink as well. So what do we expect to see 23, 24 uh, and indeed beyond that? Um, first of all it's about being, we expect to see businesses um, become more uh, goal focused, so being increasingly judged on performance against external rather than internal goals. And I think as organisations we should expect to be uh, judged um, and expect greater levels of scrutiny, both in, not in terms, not just in terms of goal setting, but also goal success as well, and the whole kind of transparency around that. I think proving provenance um, is already important, but it will become increasingly important uh, as businesses start to engage and continue to engage actions that will remove any kind of murkiness behind processes, working practices, supply chains, and so on as provenance very much becomes a uh, virtue. And I think the challenge is working out what um, to communicate uh, to who. It almost becomes a new type of risk assessment almost as companies grapple, uh, grapple with the issues of uh, trust, of competition and reputation. I think there's, historically there's been a big piece about speed solve. So there's a problem and how do we solve it quickly? And I think this trend for green polarization will start to see fade, enabling more kind of pragmatic thinking, I guess, uh, around topics such as waste, as uh, plastic reduction, packaging reduction. Um, and sometimes we can uh, speed solve with oversimplified solutions that don't necessarily work. So I think we're going to move into a space where we'll see less of that. Instead, moving to a space where we expect to see more system thinking, more system shift. Um, and that is where um, as businesses, we start to acknowledge that our businesses exist in a broader ecosystem. Um, and the fact that everything is, in connect is interconnected, we as f uh, food brands and operators operate within a much bigger universe. And I think businesses can expect greater levels of engagement and cooperation with non-traditional partnerships, as an example, joining forces with governments, with um, um, city boards, uh, NGOs, even competitors, as they start to position themselves as um, solvers for a better world. I think as a big piece uh, as we move forward, and some industries are already doing this, and parts of food are already doing this, is embracing tech for good. So leveraging this fourth industrial uh, revolution, advances in things like machine learning, um, in, in artificial intellig intelligence, in robotics, the internet of things, um, all transforming change in things like land use and water use. I was at uh, Groundswell um, earlier in the year, the Regenerative Agriculture Conference, and you think about regenerative agriculture and you, and, you, and you think of it being a very manual thing, but no, this is very, very much tech enabled. 
Uh, the second but last point I would make is about being um, Gen Z ready, and by that I mean being ready for a Gen Z workforce. Gen Z will make up much of the workforce by the time we get to 20, 20, 2030, and these kind of post-millennials are being targeted as the true generation that can get to the facts very, very quickly um, at the swipe on a digital uh, device. They're all about cross-referencing and fact-checking. Um, and transparency and business ethics, I think, will be increasingly important because Gen Z, and I know there are people in the audience that have got Gen Z kids, they want to work for, uh, they want work for businesses that they're proud to work for. And the last point, I think, um, to make is that beyond net zero, as 2050 comes into greater focus, net zero commitments um, may fade in, in favour of being climate positive by removing additional CO2 from the atmosphere, perhaps based on a percentage of their overall emissions profile. Um, and the key differentiators of this will, will be not relying on murky carbon offsetting to meet that particular goal, which is something that we're seeing an awful lot of. So, Kelly, let's talk about the, the data. Cool. So, if we, we're going to start by looking at packaging in general. So, you can see on the slide here that the table on the left um, shows the year-on-year -year changes in data. We've taken July as the focal point. Um, and then on the right, that's where we're um, showing the changes from January 2020. And the green boxes show where you've had significant year-on-year -year increase. Where it's red, we've had a significant decrease and orange shows no change, so it's, it's static. And what we can see from here is that um, recyclable packaging is still the highest and they are all high bar returnable packaging, they're all over 50%. I think we've seen um, a significant drop in recyclable, but that's been overtaken by package free. I think the produce sector have done a really good job of this, and I think that it's definitely something that other categories where possible can embrace. I think we also had a big spike on that during um, COVID. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that people need to be aware of, and, and consumers are really interested in it. I think produce, the other big important thing for consumers around that is that they can pick what, how much they want. So it's that personalization and customization piece which helps tap into that um, reduced wastage. So moving on to um, the next slide, um, and ultimately, again, the same process, same, same, follow it the same way. So on here, we've got sourcing sustainably, sustainably locally sourced, seasoned ingredients, using ethical meats, and menus with more plant-based options. So they're all still really, in, consumers are really interested in them, and they're all moving still positively. Even though they have, have stagnated, we did see that big spike in COVID. We're not surprised um, that they, they have flatlined a little. Um, but I think that the thing that I really want to pull out on this slide is the dip that we've seen on plant-based over the last couple of months. So it'll be really interesting to see um, how that unfolds as we move into Christmas and further into the cost of living crisis. I think it, we're tr we're, consumers haven't decided all of a sudden that they don't want to treat themselves. It's just what does that treat mean for people? And we're currently looking at the wider th um, topic of meat, which we'll cover in this afternoon's talk. Um, so it'd be really interesting to see what happens there with the, the plant-based options on menus. Moving on to climate positive meats, using organic ingredients, environmental certifications and climatarian diet. Top two there you'll see haven't, haven't shifted. We have seen a significant decrease in um, the environmental certifications and we believe that's because it's just not out there currently. Um, and, in, and where it is, it's not unified. Um, and we do believe that there's a big opportunity for people to, to win in this because there is still over 50% of consumers interested in that and we don't believe anybody's executing that well. We, contrary to that, we believe the climatarian diet has seen a significant increase because there are quite a lot of operators out there doing a good job of this. Um, and Charles will come on to um, give a few examples of those later on. So 
This is around wastage. So this has always been a very interesting one. I've enjoyed tracking this one. And you can see here, there's the vegetable and fruit using the whole part of the um, item. That's no surprises, a lot more appealing than, than the other two. Um, but they are all still plateauing at positive. So I think there's a real opportunity again in here around how do we educate the consumer? How do we show that this is better value? Back when we had the last economic crisis, there was a lot of undesirable meat cuts that became a lot more utilized because they were better value. So I think there's definitely an opportunity here. Um, as mentioned before at the beginning, consumers are a lot more open-minded. And what we've seen here with regards to cellular meat, you can see generally the red lines are going down, green and orange are going up. So people are becoming more interested in cellular meat. And I think even though it's not currently available in the UK, it's definitely something that operators and retailers need to be ready to go with because consumers are looking for different ways to eat, be it affecting the climate or affecting their, their purse strings. On this slide here, you can see um, we've mainly had, well, we've had stagnant growth, but um, healthy soil leads the way massively here in terms of those initiatives. It's just a more tangible thing for consumers to get their head around, I believe. It applies to a lot of different categories, and it's, it's an easier one for them to get their head around. So no surprises there. Um, and even though they're stagnant, they've still grown year on year, so it's definitely not something that can be ignored. Even if the cost of living crisis does make consumers think a little bit differently, the people who are winning this are the, the people that keep ahead with these initiatives. So where we've seen the, the biggest drop is on these ones. So we've got shorter seasonal abundant menus, shorter supply chains, going to venues that use homegrown ingredients, estate branding, using urban farms, heritage seeds, and using insects. So the majority bar urban farms have all significantly dropped from last year. Um, but they are still in line or ahead of the, when we started the tracker. So I think it's important to reference that. Um, and I think one of the observations that we've got is that this group of initiatives are a little bit more linked to consumer. They're, it's closer to them and easier for them to understand. And the decision lay, lays more on them than the operator, whereas the others were a bit further away. And I think that's something that we hear from consumers all the time. They want to be... Um, they want to help the planet, they want to do their bit, but they ultimately want you guys as operators to take that decision away from them. And now I'll hand over to Charles to give you some examples of what's going on in industry. So just a little bit more context on the uh, foresight piece. Um, despite cost of living, which we see as, a, I guess, a bit of a, a blip in the in the overall trajectory if we're to look forward five years ten years uh, from here we very much still expect environmental consciousness to be front of mind for policymakers perhaps take a slight back seat for uh, con uh, for consumers but also to remain front of mind for industry as well uh, and that's all happening because we're having a massive wake-up call just the image on the left hand side of the screen there is just one example of that but we're also having this other wake-up call in the context of cost of living. As, as Kelly's kind of touched on, um, as inflation soars, many shoppers are having to make some very, very hard choices. Compromises not only around ethics and sustainability, but also health as well. There's a really interesting piece of work carried out actually by the Food Standards Agency very recently that suggests that 65% 65 consumer, 65 of consumers have already made some changes, some switching within what they're buying, um, both out of home and uh, in home. And it's not just affecting lower income households. For most people, the sort of wider ethical um, uh, and food system interests take a slight back seat in times of financial hardship. I think one of the things to bear in mind though is make no mistake that people still care. I think when reading that report from Food Standards Agency, it came across to me loud and clear that consumers still care. They want brands to do the right thing by the planet, um, and cost of living won't change that. 
Another stat from the Food Standards Agency, 60% of consumers said that they worry about the impact of our food system on the environment. 58% say uh, the impact of climate change on food production is a major concern of theirs over the next three years. And another clear, clear takeaway for me is that consumers find it easy to engage with, and we've seen this through um, the tracking that we've been doing. Um, they find it easy to get uh, they find it easier to engage um, with uh, simple concepts like uh, food waste reduction or packaging reduction, but the more complex, the more abstract ones require a bit more consideration um, and consideration that they're probably struggling to muster now in the context of um, cost of living crisis. Sorry, Charles, can I just interrupt? Can you, um, is everyone hearing Charles okay? Right. Sorry. Is my headset not working? That's right, we're using these mics and this mic for recording. <laughs> go on, then you go for it. Sorry, Charles. Is that all right? Hey, excellent. I think what we're going to see, and I think the smart brands out there are, will define sort of better affordable products are those that, are those that work for um, consumers, for the animal, the environment, for the consumer in terms of taste and nutrient density, uh, as, as well as communities. And I think those smart brands will be those working tire tirelessly to remove price and variety and geography as a barrier to better food. So looking beyond the immediate crisis, and I'm looking, trying to look further out here than the immediate what's going on, where are the areas of traction that we expect to see over the next few years? Well, the first one to call out is about less but better meat and regenerative and agroecological farming. Regenerative agriculture is very much a buzzword of the day and expect that buzzword to continue well into the future. But with a shift from discussion uh, about principles um, to outcomes, I think that's the really important thing. There's going to be gro there is growing concern already out there about corporate greenwashing when it comes to uh, regenerative agriculture. So we expect to see greater scrutiny on organisations really de delivering on the results of those promises, those on-farm metrics. Some of the images on the screen there are great examples of some of the things that we're seeing. Um, Ethical Butcher, a great example, who are putting that into practice through the meat that they're providing into restaurants and also direct to consumers as well. And then at a corporate level, some of the work that Unilever and some of the big uh, players are doing as well. I think in summary, regenerative farming is about a system of farming practices uh, that gives back. That at the, end, the end result is about a net positive uh, effect. Uh, and that it's a whole system, and it's illustrated by the graphic in the top right-hand corner there, um, that brings lots of different things and practices together that drive biodiversity, enriches soils, they rotate crops, perhaps bring animals into the equation as well. Uh, and do a huge amount for improving watershed and local ecosystems as well. Also watch out for agroecological farming practices um, this year, next year and beyond. And agroecology really builds on that kind of accumulated knowledge um, from practices um, within farming cultures that, that have been um, bought, uh, brought up and passed down through many generations, really ad adapting to their local climate, to the local ground, uh, and it's regenerative in the sense that it gives back to the land and creates a positive cycle within farming practice. So I think regenerative is one of those things that is perhaps hard for consumers to get their head around. But I think if you're in this space, I think it's about working hard to educate and to inform and make it relevant. Moving on from that, we expect to see more talking dirt or soil, and there is uh, a very real difference. I, I know that there are some gardeners in the audience and they'll be very, very familiar with the importance of soil. 
Uh, it, re it remains um, a primary business asset, obviously, for a farmer, but the importance of healthy soil goes far beyond just the farm gate. Obviously, it's a supported human societies uh, for uh, millennia, um, and it is the platform uh, for which all um, species uh, are, are built and, 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 and support. So, as such, soils need appropriate and sympathetic management to ensure that they function as they should. They're remarkable systems. Uh, they're extremely complex. Uh, anybody that's been watching any of the programs about the, the plethora of networks under the ground, how plants and so on communicate is, is uh, absolutely mind-blowing. The amount of living material below the ground uh, is almost equal and often more so than that above the ground. One handful of soil contains many, many thousands of microorganisms, all working in harmony to regulate the soil, regulate climate and our environment. And soils function by virtue of the way that they are uh, put together and the interactions that uh, occur between them with the sort of myriad of physical, um, chemical and biological components within, within them. And these occur in this astonishingly complex labyrinth of connections in what's called soil biota. And that is basically all the bugs, all the organisms, all the um, all the connections, all the earthworms and mites and all of that kind of thing, that all of those regulate uh, how water and, and air and oxygen are held in the fabric of the soil. Um, and also they control how gases pass, um, uh, carbon uh, sequestration. Um, it's an incredibly complex system. Um, so it's, it's very, very important. And we expect a growing level of education um, over the coming months of years, and it's really heartening to see how that's resonating in the tracker. I think because it's real, you know, if you know, people often walk, you know, you walk on soil, even if you don't have a garden, you might walk in parks, it's a relatable thing. So, expect to hear more talk about soil, and also expect to hear more about feed. Um, we're seeing an increased level of awareness and differentiation based on what animals are eating during their lives, whether that's pure grass-fed, whether that's eating herbal lays uh, to improve uh, the feed quality. But again, uh, herbal lays also improve soil structure, again, benefit uh, carbon sequestration, um, improve biodiversity, attract more birds and insects. And recently we've seen a number of farmers and uh, brands for focusing on soy free and slower growing breeds of chicken, which I think is really interesting. So uh, this is chicken that doesn't feed on um, soy meal that will have come undoubtedly from South America, but instead from the insects that are on the pasture on which they forage, uh, but also on their eating wheat and also uh, in some cases spent rapeseed oil as well. They're often slower growing, um, some of them up to about 100 days, so they really deliver on flavour uh, as well. Seeing a similar kind of thing in pork as well, I don't know if anybody's seen any other soy-free pork that's out there as well. Um, so expect this discussion around feed to grow as a differentiator. And one of the biggest issues for consumers is around trust and information to make a positive and informed choice. Um, this is beginning to change. There are a number of schemes being piloted by uh, brands and retailers. One example is Foundation Earth's Eco Impact Score, um, where they monitor um, three key criteria, water usage, water pollution, biodiversity, and carbon. Uh, and it's about gathering, obviously, the information, uh, conducting life cycle assessment to put the numbers and impacts finally award the score that you would see on the front of pack. A couple examples there on the left-hand side. Any eco-labelling clearly uh, needs to communicate uh, um, simplicity. It needs to be applicable to all foods. It needs to be fair. I think really importantly, it needs to encourage positive change. Um, a couple of other examples from the food service space. Uh, Oaxaca have recently partnered with the climate experts uh, uh, Kilomato um, to calculate carbon footprints. So you can see that on the bottom left-hand side there. Uh, also, Camille Tive recently partnered with My Emissions to encourage, uh, to implement the carbon labelling 
uh, on menus, and that carbon labelling will appear alongside nutritional values to encourage consumers to buy lower carbon or lower impact food. This is great. Um, currently, there are many systems. I think that's one of the challenges, and Kelly touched on this. They're all providing visibility, but the lack of unification will undoubtedly cause some confusion for consumers. Um, ultimately, we expect to see some policy in this space, um, but not in the immediate future. Again, despite cost of living crisis, we expect to see brands and operators that occupy this space um, to make the experience and the communication around it more engaging and more empowering. I think new levels uh, of access to information have transformed how consumers make food choices, and many of them are hungrier than ever um, to um, take personal accountability for impact. And this is some examples of, uh, of brands and businesses that are tapping into that. I think we'll see increasingly brands uh, standing out in this space, working hard to communicate their message. And although uh, traction during cost of living crisis may be muted, I think our experience from previous recessions show that brands and businesses that invest to stick to their principles in this time will ultimately reap the rewards um, when we come out. And the examples on the screen there, you've got VFC there on the left-hand side, uh, Honest Burger and Ethical Butcher. We've got more champions ever, than ever before in the food service space, which I think, and hospitality space, which is really exciting. There's never been, really, despite everything that's going on, a better time to eat out in a sustainable way. And there are many more chefs leading the charge when it comes to reducing waste, serving less but better meat, making veg led not only tasty but also cool as well. Um, there are many more outlets now focusing their work um, with uh, local and seasonal growers, zero waste, slower growing breeds and older meat, things like uh, ex-dairy cow and uh, coal yore. Some even going as far as developing entire closed loop systems altogether. So hospitality now has many more champions. We have the, obviously the ultimate master, Doug McMaster, but also new, new people coming along. Uh, w5 collective i think is really interesting what they're doing they build themselves as london's first climate positive restaurant um chantal nicholson has long been um uh, fighting for uh, fighting the sustainable fight i should say she's taken her less but better meat and veg forward approach to her new restaurant uh, in mayfair apricity a native i think is also a really really nice uh, example Ivan uh, Tisdall uh, Downs and Imogen Davis. They're great young pioneers of uh, British wild food. Uh, the foraging pair have taken their native concept inside the Browns Boutique on, on Brook Street, um, if anybody's interested. Something else that we expect to gain, increasingly gain momentum is that around local food diversity. Um, there's been increasing attention and scrutiny and debate on the resilience of our global uh, food commodity chains uh, and our central distribution networks in light like of the pandemic. In the UK we import 77% of all of our fresh fruit and vegetables which are predominantly sold as we know through centralised retail dominated systems. I expect to see much more citizen demand for greater diversity of nutritious uh, culturally appropriate and local foods. The example in the centre there uh, is the 25 mile menu uh, from the Pig Hotels. A number of food businesses are also starting to explore what are often called the, the, um, the forgotten crops. Uh, Hodmedods is a really good example of that. Um, today, 75% of the global food supply comes from over 12 plants, only 12 plants and five animal species and just three, which are rice, maize and wheat, make up 60% of all the calories from plants in the human diet. Yet there are over 20,000 edible species of plants out there, and many of them which are nutrient rich may well be more suited to the changing climatic conditions uh, that we see. Continued massive focus on waste reduction and upcycling is a really, really interesting space. Um, Recently, World Wildlife Fund and Tesco uh, published Driven to Waste, which is uh, an eye-opening report um, that quantifies the total amount of lost food 
uh, on farms but also across the entire uh, food system with an estimated 2.5 billion tonnes of food going uneaten around the world uh, every year. Um, that's about 40% of what we produce um, goes uneaten and it's higher than the 33% um, that was widely recognised up until that point. Um, a really nice example though from a hospitality world um, is Fallow Restaurant and there are many others now following uh, in their footsteps. They re I think it was last week they said um, that they've now served 4,000 portions of their cod's head with sriracha butter there on the left hand side and that's inspiring many chefs not only in the UK but around the globe to do similar things to bring back those those uh, traditionally wasted cuts or byproducts and serving them in new different uh, and inventive ways. Another really good example is AB InBev's um, a spin out company called Evergrain. Um, where they, it's a, they're a, a, a sustainable ingredient business basically, they transform the spent barley um, uh, grains from the production of the likes of Budweiser into nutritional ingredients that are rich in protein and fibre that can be added to bread, baked products, uh, sauces, convenience meals. It's one of the most sustainable sources globally of plant protein and fibre. And the last one um, Kelly touched on, the one that we put on the tracker now a couple of years ago, which is about the new protein system. The possibility of creating meat and other products in the laboratory is moving ever closer, despite the challenges, which we, we can all recognise as being numerous, consumer acceptance being one, but we can see that the principle of that at least is beginning uh, to edge to a, a position of greater acceptance, cost, uh, scalability and of course regulatory approval. To date there's only one lab grown product that is approved for sale, which is the Eat Just product which was approved for sale in Singapore in December 2020. But just this one example has shown that those barriers um, are not, they're difficult, but not impossible to overcome. But we're seeing this discussed in a far more mainstream space. So it is part, it is, uh, part of the consumer psyche. Um, it was recently featured, I don't, did anybody watch Earthshot? Yeah. Um, and I'm sure a few of you might watch things like Country File as an example. Three million people in the UK watch Country File every week. And we're seeing it also reported in the, um, the mass market uh, media as well, in, in printed papers and magazines and so on. This type of technology receives the developmental support of some governments, um, particularly in Singapore for obvious reasons, it's an extremely small landmass, and Israel combining with US-led tech and investment. But literally over the last couple of weeks, uh, the Netherlands government is helping to make cell-based agriculture a reality. They legalised the sampling of cultured meat, so if this event was happening in the Netherlands, you'd be able to sample it and try it. Um, but they've also uh, allocated 60 million of public funding uh, to research in this space. It's going to be really exciting to see uh, where they prioritise that investment over the next kind of few weeks. So I think. We've said this before, but it's really important to consider what this disruptor could mean for your business, brands, and in general, our attitudes uh, to meat production. One of the really interesting things um, is the fact that scaling of this doesn't have to mean huge factories. Um, I did a podcast a few weeks ago with a guy called Iltid Dunsford on our um, podcast series called The Food People In Conversation With, um, and he's done an awful lot of work on miniaturizing the technology required to do this. So this his future vision for the food system in the UK uh, is mind-blowing. It's about 35 minutes. Have a listen to it, because he will change your view on cell-based meats and what you think the future looks like, to a point where his vision is that this uh, using cell-based uh, agriculture, producing cell-based meat can be brought into communities and it can happen locally on farms by people that you trust and care. Um, so from all of this, what are the kind of key takeouts? First of all, appreciate that we're in a period of consumer confusion where they do feel conflicted and are making different decisions. But 
I would urge you that if, if this is your space, keep to your principles. Consumers do still care about sustainability and ESG, as we've seen from the data. Work hard to make these messages real, uh, make them relevant and relatable, I think is very important. Consumers find abstract, complex theories challenging to get their head around. So some of the things that we've talked about, they find it more challenging in times of economic uncertainty. Um, and they're making, they are making compromises on their principles, but they expect brands, they expect operators to take these problems away and deal with the problem and do the right thing. And I think there is an obligation for us uh, within the food industry. And there are areas to win if communication can link to ESG. I'll come back to that. Okay. A couple of things before we finish. Um, in 2020, we found ourselves asking if we were to deliver on our purpose of shifting the future of food and drink, we needed to influence our future generations um, and encourage them to have better and healthier relationships with food and drink. And that starts in schools. So we started the Food People Foundation. Um, since then, we've donated almost £70,000 to our partner charities, one of which is Chefs in Schools, to elevate the food offer in education um, and take school food to the, the next level. So we launched, we have our e-book. All, all of the proceeds from our e-book go directly to Chefs in Schools, um, who are reaching 20, over 22,000 kids in over 60 schools. Um, so if you share our obsession with um, trends, with food and drink, and concern for our future generations, if you click that QR code and buy a copy of our 16 Years in Trends e-book, I guarantee that your purchase will make a difference to what chefs in schools are doing. Um, we will circulate that if you didn't have a moment to scan that QR code. But you might also want to scan this QR code, again, which will also be circulated separately as well, if you'd like a copy of this presentation and also to be added to the Future Food mailing list to receive all of the updates on the ongoing tracker. Kelly. So thank you everybody for joining us today and taking the time to listen. I hope that there's been a couple of nuggets in there that might make you think differently or areas that you hadn't thought of before. If there's anything that anybody would like to add into the tracker, um, then please feel free to drop us an email because we have got space for a couple of extra bits. If there's any burning questions anybody wants to ask or if you just want to put a question out to our community, then we're more than happy to do that. But um, thank you all very much for coming. And we'll be back at 3.30 to talk plant-based and cuisine. So we'll see you then. Thank you.